வணக்கம் in the next 8 minutes or so i shall be talking about the tips and tricks in the management of fokman's ischemic contracture associated with each of the following steps in making a diagnosis in ordering the relevant investigations in planning the management schedule in the surgical technique and finally in the follow up and therapy first of all it is very important to make a correct diagnosis and an accurate understanding of the basic pathology in the fokman's ischemic contracture because it is going to form the basis of our management a very simple trick to understand the type of fokman's ischemic contracture that we are dealing with would be to analyze the following criteria if it has got involvement of only the fdp and involves a few fingers with no sensory disturbances but there is a tenodesis effect and no joint contractures and no paralysis of intrinsic muscles it is a type 1 if it involves the fds and fdp of all the fingers and sometimes other flexors like the wrist flexors and there is a sensory disturbance with the tenodesis effect and a paralysis of the intrinsic muscles but with no joint contractures it is a type 2 in addition to all the above features if there are joint contractures too it falls under the type 3 category of vic having made a diagnosis and having understood the severity of the problem we need basically two investigations apart from the routine investigations the first is x rays to note the bone or joint position which will tell us the status of the joint whether it is correctable or needs fusion and secondly nerve conduction studies which will tell us the status of the nerves and the amount of damage that the nerves have undergone now comes the important part of planning the management protocol in a severe case of fokman's ischemic contracture like this it may be a little complicated so we need to see some tricks to understand this the simplest trick would be to use what is known as the s3 m2 protocol in this protocol basically we assess five parameters the skin problem referred to as the s1 the skeletal problem referred to as s2 the problem of sensation s3 then assess the passive range of movements which is m1 and then finally assess the active range of movements which is referred to as m2 so we have 3 s assessment and 2 m assessment to understand it further we shall see the details of the s3 m2 protocol assessment in the assessment of s1 that is the skin problem whether there is a contracture or an unstable scar as a result of grafting or just deficiency of normal skin we need to first resurface all these with a good durable quality skin in the form of a flap cover in assessing the s2 that is the underlying skeletal problem it may be an underlying bone problem which could be a malunited fracture of the forearm bones or it could be a joint capsular contractures typically consisting of elbow flexion forearm pronation wrist flexion digital claw and thumb adduction in case of a bony problem the stabilization of the skeleton should be done and in case of joint capsular contractures release of the contractures and skin cover should be given and if that is not possible bony stabilization procedures like proximal or distal row carpectomy radial or ulnar shortening wrist fusion or digital joint fusion should be planned providing the basic protective sensation to the hand is very important before going ahead with the motor reconstruction so the assessment of s3 which is sensation should be done and to provide the basic protective sensation procedures like neurolysis free nerve grafting a pedicle nerve grafting or transfer as described by saint clair strange or vascularized nerve transfer may be done before reanimating the inactive muscles we need to make sure that the joints are soft and supple and this can be achieved by an assessment of m1 which is assessment of the passive range of movements and any stiff joints can be made supple by using physiotherapy stretching splints or even surgical release if necessary once the full passive range of movements has been achieved we need to assess the muscles that are not acting which are mainly the flexors in fokman's ischemic contractures it is simple to remember that the plan of management would depend upon whether the flexors are acting that is with an mrc grade of 4 or 5 or when the flexors are not acting that is an mrc grade of less than 4 this is because any surgical procedure on the acting flexor will reduce the power of the flexor by one grade the next point to assess 
when the flexors are acting is the Folkman's angle that is the angle of the wrist flexion that should be done to achieve full passive extension of the fingers as in this example in whom the Folkman's angle is 90 degrees. So a simple tip to remember what plan to make when the flexors are acting is when the Folkman angle is less than 30 degrees it is a very minimal shortening of the tendons and fractional distraction lengthening can be planned. When the Folkman angle is about 30 degrees to 50 degrees, a tendon lengthening procedure with Z plasty can be planned. But if the angle is more than 50 degrees, a muscle slide operation should be done. However, when the flexors are not acting, it could be the FDP alone not acting of the fingers while the FDS is acting like in cases of type 1 VIC and in these patients an FDS to FDP transfer can be planned and in case both the FDP and FDS are not acting but the extensors are acting an extensor to flexor transfer can be planned and in severe cases where the FDP, the FDS and the extensors are not acting a free functional muscle transfer will be required. Having made a management protocol is good enough. But when we go into the actual surgical procedure, there are some important steps and we shall see the single most important step or the important steps that are required in the commonly done procedures for Folkman's ischemic contracture. When doing the digital fractional lengthening procedure, we divide only the intramuscular tendinous portion of the flexor muscles that are contracted and it is important to remember that the finger should not be stretched after this is done. The tendon lengthening procedure can be done by a Z plasty of the involved tendons but making sure that the sutured portion of the tendon is well within the forearm and does not go into the zone 4 where adhesions are very likely. In the muscle slide operation an extensive incision on the forearm is made. The flexor origin is erased taking care to preserve the median and ulnar nerves and the normal cascade position of the fingers must be achieved. As far as the FDS to FDP transfer is concerned, the important points to remember are that the FDS which is the donor should be divided distally, the FDP which is the recipient should be divided proximally and tension adjustment to achieve the flexion cascade must be perfect. As we have seen, when the extensor muscles are intact, the extensor tendons can be transferred to the flexor side. The commonest done procedure is the transfer of the extensor carpi radialis longus to the flexor distorum profundus and the transfer of the brachioradialis to the flexor pollicis longus. It is important to remember when doing this transfer that a pulver taft weave is ideal so that we have a strong repair which can work well. As far as the use of free functional muscle transfer for Folkman's ischemic contracture is concerned, the gristlis is most commonly used. The important steps are the meticulous harvest of the gristlis muscle, if possible including a skin paddle for monitoring, adjusting the tension of the muscle when it is being sutured after creating a good origin and a strong insertion. The muscle should not be overly stretched or too relaxed. A good vascular anastomosis and a nerve coaptation are required for achieving good function. As far as the follow-up and therapy are concerned after surgery for Folkman's ischemic contracture, a prudent use of the steps of mobilization and immobilization must be followed. 